Hey, this is Simon Rosenberg from NDN. Welcome, folks, to one of our periodic conversations with thought leaders and entrepreneurs and people doing interesting things that we thought would be of interest to our community. And uh, Tara and I actually don't know each other that well. I mean, we've sort of operated in parallel circles uh, for a long time, and um, I'm really excited to have her with me today. This is, we're going to be talking about a subject that I've been Worked, working on my entire life really in politics. You know, I started in this business. I started out of college as a TV producer and writer for ABC News. I have primetime production credits. I grew up in the media business and then made the transition to politics. And so my area of focus has historically always been on sort of cutting edge media strategies to help advance our cause. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, as part of the war room in 92, I put the DNC on the internet. I was the first person to put a, uh, a major political party uh, on the internet in 1993. And, um, you know, and I have been part of a group of people in our family who've been trying to make sure that we stayed ahead and, and that uh, in a changing media environment. And, you know, what I'm really pleased to bring, uh, the reason I'm so happy Tara's here today is that she's really part of the next generation of leaders and thought leaders and innovators and pioneers and courageous folks trying to bang through this noisy media environment that we're in. And um, I'm gonna let her, because my internet's a little bit unstable, I'm gonna just turn to her and let her explain to you who she is and her background and how she got here and what she's trying to do about it. And, and I'm really excited to hear from her and, and really pleased that all of you could join us today. So Tara, I'm gonna turn it to you and hopefully my internet will stabilize here a little bit. Thank you, Simon. And thank you for all of the work you've done and keep doing. I think, uh, the way that Simon and I uh, started engaging with each other, of course, on, on the internet, mostly on Twitter, <laughs> um, was because I was so excited to see someone with a, a platform out there talking about how things were not as dire uh, as uh, as the media and pundits and even folks on the left were saying for many, many months. Um, people are not saying that as much anymore, but Simon was one of the few uh, that, was, um, that was getting the tea leaves out there early, that things were different and that we couldn't rely on conventional wisdom or data. Um, this cycle and now that 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 is that is bearing out of course I think we both would say as Simon said this before we were on with you all um that he is cautiously optimistic that is my answer whenever anyone asks me how I'm feeling about the midterms I feel very cautiously optimistic we've been in this work too long um to 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 uh think that um things can't change really quickly on a dime and of course races are tightening as we speak so we know that there's still a lot of work to do um and every day matters between now and election day but um, yeah, I'll give everybody a little bit of background. Um, uh, it's uh, it's good to see some familiar names uh, in the chat and, and a lot of uh, new names. So my name is Tara McGowan. I am uh, the founder and publisher of Courier Newsroom um, and the CEO of its parent company that I started, Good Information, Inc., um, I was a journalist long, long, long ago. Very briefly, I went to journalism school and I worked at 60 Minutes and Frontline and, um, and, and left uh, to, to make a pivot into politics after covering the 2008 election. I was very swept up in that election um, and, uh, and, and then candidate Obama's uh, candidacy and, and, and promises. And so I decided to kind of turn my hand into politics and uh, became a digital strategist, uh, whatever that meant at the time. I, I'm a digital native, I'm 36 years old. I really did grow up on the internet. Um, and, and so all of the work that I started to do in politics around storytelling and uh, video production in particular from my journalism days, um, it all happened on the internet. And so that's, that's kind of where I, I, I grew my expertise is understanding social media platforms in particular and how to communicate on them and how um, to leverage them to be able to reach more people and reach them in ways that are um, genuine and effective at informing them and mobilizing them. Um, the challenge there, uh, there are many, is that these platforms change constantly. The internet changes constantly. Our experience with it, our relationship to um, uh, digital platforms and our digital selves is always uh, always evolving. And so um, it, it means that you have to take a really different tact. You can't rely on the same strategies or tactics to do this work and to do it well. Um, but as I grew up in politics um, professionally, and as my my career started to develop, I, I started to get bigger jobs with um, bigger budgets and bigger programs and teams and opportunities to make a difference. And I, I found that our 
ecosystem, our infrastructure, even our kind of community of strategists and leaders were not evolving as quickly <laughs> as we needed to in a lot of ways. Um, and, and so I became really uh, committed to, to trying to build new kinds of infrastructure, new kinds of organizations um, that could help us actually stay on, if not ahead of the curve, and be able to adapt quickly and be nimble and be able to communicate um, to Americans in real time, especially given the enormous power and influence of the right-wing media and how quickly um, and effectively they were able to evolve and maximize um, uh, social media algorithms and platforms to distribute their message and increasingly disinformation more quickly um, while we were still relying on the left on traditional advertising for the most part, television, radio, direct mail, and increasingly uh, digital advertising, which I did a lot of work on. Um, and yet we still were always up against this incredibly powerful messaging machine because they had their own media infrastructure. And so uh, it was not a novel idea to build left-leaning media, certainly. Um, Simon was involved in this for many years. There were a lot of efforts um, uh, that have happened throughout the decades, and yet we really found ourselves in a, in a tough spot um, over the past 10 years where we, we weren't able to compete, advertising wasn't competing any longer. And they, especially in the era of Trump, um, it just became way more potent and powerful. And as he and other candidates started to just blatantly lie much more frequently, there wasn't a check on it because they can distribute their message on their own directly to millions and millions of people online. So as the, as the media ecosystem shifted and became more decentralized and disruptive, our, our strategies and tactics and what we leaned on to get our message across or for campaigns to get their message across just wasn't sufficient any longer. And I personally became very frustrated at raising lots of money, running what I, I felt and my team felt were really effective advertising programs. Um, but then the relationship with voters that we were reaching ended when the campaign ended. We weren't actually building deeper relationships. We weren't building trust. It was very churn and burn. And that was frustrating to me because I, I felt that we could take even just a small percentage of the money spent on one-way advertising and build infrastructure that could really build trust um, and build audience engagement and become, uh, become media platforms that would be able to distribute our message and our values um, and the facts, frankly, and the truth, which gets lost in today's media environment every day, year round, and that that, if we were successful, could actually expand the progressive electorate in this country. And so that's what I have been working on in a very humble way. Um, we started Courier in 2019. It turned three years old in June. Uh, we now have uh, newsrooms in eight states across the country. Uh, we are in Arizona, Florida, Iowa, Michigan, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Wisconsin, Folks on this Zoom can guess why we are in those places. Uh, they matter the most when we look at the Electoral College um, and we think about uh, being able to, to build progressive power in this country um, because of their outsized influence on uh, the state of our democracy and our politics and our government. It's also where the most disinformation spreads. It's where the most saturation of political advertising spreads. And so it's where we see the most um, uh, really, really alarming um, uh, kind of decline in trust in media and other institutions. And so we felt if we started anywhere, we needed to start in those spaces first and then expand. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the model and then Simon, yeah. I want to kick back to you because I feel like I'm, I'm talking a lot. But no, no, I'll, you're doing great, Tara. Keep I'll going. Say the, I'll say the three things that really kind of differentiate Courier from other um, news organizations or media companies, even if they're left-leaning. Like, yes, we are left-leaning. We're transparent about our values. That doesn't make us as unique as these other attributes. Um, the first one is that we have a very specific audience that we care about. Um, uh, traditional media, you kind of build it and you expect people to come, right? Except today, there are tens of millions of Americans who we describe as passive news consumers. Um, they do not get, uh, they do not proactively look for good information or news in part because they don't need to. Uh, they are on Facebook, they're on Instagram, they're on TikTok, they have search engines on their phones that they have with them everywhere. They're getting the information um, delivered to them in a very passive experience. And the algorithms learn from what they like and what they click and who they follow to deliver them a curated feed. And so they no longer are, are going to websites or you know, checking their local newspaper's website every day to see what's going on. For the most part, they're 
our audience that we care about are not watching cable news. Um, they are, they're not listening to NPR and they don't pay paywalls. They don't read long articles. Um, everyone's attention span is, is short now, but uh, this audience in particular, they're not politically engaged um, and they don't vote very often. So 50% of our audience at Courier um, and our target audience that we hope to continue to build trust with across our states, 50% of them did not vote at all until after the 2016 election. So these are new voters if they vote at all. Um, and that means that it is even more imperative to keep them informed and engaged to vote again, because when you vote twice or three times after not being a regular voter, you can become a lifelong voter. It becomes a, 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 a habitual um, behavior. And that's what we're hoping for is to get more people who were animated or outraged or inspired to vote over the past few years to keep voting and to get even more engaged. And so our hypothesis is to do that by reaching them where they are, um, which is like the second piece of our model that's different, which is they're mostly on social media. And so um, our distribution and our content development, our reporters on the ground in our states, they don't write long articles. They actually, we have trained them because there's not a bench of these folks. We've trained local print journalists to actually think about the user first, to think about this, this voter, this American first in their state and distill the most important information for them into videos and graphics that they can consume and skim um, on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, and then of course have resources available on the sites that they can go to. Um, and we do email newsletters as well. So the Axios model, smart brevity, right? Even for high information consumers like everyone here, I love knowing that it's gonna take me three and a half minutes to read my Callens mm -hmm. newsletter in the morning because uh, that's how quickly we're now um, absorbing information. So we really prioritize native social content as news, and, and that shouldn't be that transformative, but it is. A lot of news organizations still just publish and market their journalism on social media platforms to get you back to their site so you can read the article and they can sell ads. Um, we don't do that. We make sure that the information can be absorbed as you're scrolling and that it's it really can be a passive experience. Uh, and then the third thing that makes us different is that we measure our impact. Something I was always frustrated by when I was a reporter was that uh, once you put a story out in the world or a documentary or a piece in 60 Minutes, you didn't really know how it did. You could get like ratings and views and things of that nature, but you don't you don't actually know if it makes a difference unless, for instance, it creates a lawsuit or, you know, a larger news story that carries on. And when it comes to the work that we're so passionate about at Courier, it really is civic participation. So we need to know. We need to know if our journalism is actually making a difference at making people vote and vote more often. And so we run experiments where we boost our news with advertising dollars on social media to our audience. And we take a segment of that audience as a control group and we don't give them any of our news content. And then after the elections, when the voter files are updated, we analyze the results and we see the difference in turnout between the group of our audience that did not get our coverage and the group that did. And we've run these experiments a number of times and every single time we have increased turnout among our audience in a statistically significant way. And that gets really nerdy and very data-driven, but it's a really mm -hmm. important piece of the puzzle because um, it helps us get smarter and know that this is making a difference. And this is a model that really is an important layer to all of the other good work that people on the ground are doing, knocking on doors and making phone calls and the advertising work that is getting the candidates' messages across. This is how we're gonna build long-term trust and actually be able to truly drive the conversation instead of always be in a defensive posture responding to the conversation that the right wing is often driving. And that's the vision of this is to do this and be everywhere. So uh, we really can build the, the more equitable, fair and, and representative democracy that we all want. And the time is very short. So uh, that is a lot of information that gives yeah. you a lot to dig into Simon, but that's, yeah. that's a career. Okay, so I have a couple initial questions or things I want you to comment on. And first of all, that was awesome. I've actually never heard the whole pitch. And so it was terrific. And thank you for your vision and your willing to take willingness to take risks here and all this. Um, talk a little bit about, at a very basic level, the difference between the broadcast era of political communications and the era of social media amplification, organic content and all this, because I, I think this is still a threshold thing we're struggling with, frankly, on the center left, that 
remarkably, almost 20 years after the Dean campaign, sort of reinvented the way we all run presidential campaigns, which the Obama campaign then dramatically improved upon, right? We're still kind of struggling with, you know, as somebody who grew up in the broadcast era of political communications, and I, I'm still kind of amazed at how oriented we are as a sort of top-down, I mean, I joke when I talk to press secretaries now is that, you know, you send out these press releases that nobody ever reads and have no, you know, and you need to be doing more than press releases and, you know, just reflect a little bit about this transition and, and how this informed the strategy and the architecture of what you built. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a great question. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, it informs everything, right? This is, I think, Something that's interesting is that there's there's not a lot of dialogue about this necessarily. Um, there was after the 2016 election where it was like, oh my God, Facebook. Suddenly, right, the the immense power and reach of Facebook became well more well known because it was such an integral tool for Trump to be able to build a very fast base of support, don't funding fundraising base, et cetera. Um, but prior to that, there just wasn't that much knowledge about the reach and scale of social media. So zooming back out, um, you know, when I grew up, when you grew up, when everyone on this call, I imagine, unless you were born in the 90s, or the 2000s, which always freaks me out a little bit, but anyone else remembers a time where we really did live in a centralized information environment. There were a few trusted messengers and publishers and organizations that delivered the news. And yes, the right wing media has existed, right, for, for over 50 years now. And yet, there, there was the evening news. There was your local news that existed. There was um, the, you know, the 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 evening news anchors on NBC, ABC, CBS. And so, if you if you skimmed between the three, which I worked at the CBS Evening News for a little while, so we were always looking at the other ones. You're often getting the same four to six stories a night, right? Like there was just like this judgment call that was made and it was very aligned. They weren't even coordinating with each other, the executive producers of these evening shows because they're in competition for viewers. And yet they would all come to generally the same conclusions most days about what the top most important stories for Americans to know were. Same thing with the newspapers like New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, et cetera. Um, there, there was a consensus of, and there were, there was trust in media at that point in time. Um, that it, it was imperfect. There's corporate media, there's bias in media, there's, object, there's a lot of things that I could talk about that are wrong with media then and today. Um, but it, there was just less. And the internet exploded that, but it took some time and social media then accelerated it dramatically, where we moved from centralized, like, almost siloed information ecosystem where a few people were deciding what information the masses were getting. But you had a real certainty that you were reaching most people with that information into a decentralized environment where suddenly the world is your oyster. You can get any information you want. You can get any disinformation you want. You can back up any fact or lie you want on the internet. And on social media, because of the development of these algorithms, you could make things that were far more salacious or weird or, um, you know, things about corruption, things like that move so much more quickly. So disinformation's always existed, but suddenly in social media, it could go so much more quickly because the second people started engaging with it, the algorithm would reward it and show it to more and more people. And so it really turned into a disinformation machine in the internet, but it took some time. It was such like a lovely, happy place in the beginning to some degree. And then, you know, we really started to see the underbelly like we do with any new medium when it's created because, you know, bad actors will always leverage all the tools available to them. And so that, that evolution has really put us in a position now where it is a game of whack-a-mole, right? There's a lot of conversation about disinformation and how to stop it. And a lot of conversation, especially in the media world about fact checking and all of these different tools and things like that. The issue is you're never gonna be able to root it all out unless we didn't have an internet, it's not going away. So what you have to do is you have to literally figure out where the most disinformation is spreading, where the most people are going for their information and make sure that there is good factual information in those spaces. And the media industry has not adapted. Instead, in order to have sustainable business models, they have started to prioritize on paying consumers. 
we're seeing it in streaming, right? Which is taking over entertainment TV is the apps that you decide to buy. And now you're spending more than you were spending on your cable, cable bills because you want to see this show on Hulu and this one HBO, et cetera. And same thing goes with traditional news and online news, which is that you're, you have to, you have a meter, you've hit your fourth story, you have to pay through a paywall. So many people are not going to pay because they're getting so much content and frankly, so much shit, excuse my language, when they're just scrolling for free on social media and they're entertained and they think they're informed or they are informed, what have you. And so that's a really tough thing. I just want to call that out and then I want to get back to you, Simon, but like, that's a really tough thing to navigate. <laughs> I want to like mm -hmm. put a, like a note of defense to like any political party, right? Like the other side has no shame. They will blatantly lie on cable television. They will blatantly spread lies on the internet that will spread like wild wildfire. And they do not care if it helps them achieve their agenda. We, on our side, and sometimes I'm frustrated by this, but we have a very high moral bar. It is part of what makes progressives progressives. We want equal opportunity for everyone. We want all of these things. And, and so like, we can't take advantage of the worst of what's been created in the new media environment and the internet to get messages across more quickly. It's just more challenging. You have to be more artful. You have to be more targeted. And so it is, it is tough, but I am very hopeful because over the past five years, I feel like I have seen um, an increase and in acceleration of education about this new disruptive dis decentralized ecosystem. And the idea that you really do have to, you have to build content, you have to create channels that actually are authentic and build trust with different communities instead of thinking about the masses. And so the White House can't do that. They've got limited time to get a lot of stuff done. They have a bully pulpit, they use the media. That doesn't work as much today. So they've evolved on digital, but like they're still constrained. The movement is not. We have got to build this infrastructure and build these channels and build these platforms so we can actually cultivate trusted communities and organize within those communities. And that's the benefit of the internet and social media, but it's also obviously when it's not used for good, the detriment. Yeah, it is amazing. You know, I have, my three kids are 22, 20 and 19 and 17. And it is amazing how much information they get from a trusted human in some place, yeah. right? You know, and, you know, my son learned how to build computers because he followed Linus Tech Tips, right? I mean, whoever Linus was, right? And he just found him on the internet. And the decentralized nature and these trusted communities that you're talking about are, you know, it's why the influencer part of politics is becoming really interesting. But let, let, me, let me go to one other, I had, I had one other question about, you know, I think as somebody who worked in the war room and our backgrounds are somewhat similar in the sense that I, you know, was a TV producer and writer and then made the transition over, as you did, um, I'm not sure that I ever considered myself a journalist, but I worked in TV news, uh, but, and that's another discussion, right? Is that um, the, the um, oh my God, I'm forgetting my own question here, but the, um, I think uh, I'm forgetting, I've just, I made a joke, I shouldn't have done that, I should have stayed disciplined, but I think, I, I think you've raised so many issues today. Oh, I know what I was gonna say is that I, when we worked in the war room in 92, I think there's been a miss, sort of the mythology of the war room, I think has misinterpreted a little bit about what we thought we were doing. And the story has been about rapid response, but that's not what the war room was about, actually. It was about winning the information war every day. And which meant you had to go on offense and have an agenda first, and then you had to respond to attacks. And I have this belief that in working with younger comms people today, there's too much of our understanding of this, of the info wars, whatever we call it, this engaged information environment. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of laying down, of being loud and laying down our track first, right? And getting out in front and defining the terms of the debate has been lost a little bit in the, in the way that we approach all of this. And so what happens is that if the goal is rapid response, beating back disinformation, you're already starting in a deficit, right? You're already behind. Right. It's all defense and not, and that, you know, I have this old line, you know, I've been doing this so long, right? We come up with these things that we say all the time in our presentations. And I've had this line for a long time, which is if you're not on offense in politics, you're losing. And I, I think that part of what you're trying to do, right, is you're trying to go and create positive content, irregardless of the attacks or anything else. You're just going out and saying your piece and connecting with folks. And just reflect upon that a little bit, because I think this is also a really big 
kind of like orientation structural thing in our family that we've got to work through a little bit more about. We need to be louder every day. We have to, I, it, the term I use is loud, right? That's the language I use. Mm -hmm. Just reflect on that for everybody a little yeah, bit. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I mean, the time old, like saying, right? Uh, the best defense is a good offense. Like you yeah. have to, you have to drive offense. We actually are in a really, um, opportune moment right now where I do believe that our family, I love you call it our family. It, it is a dysfunctional mm -hmm. one, but it is a family. Yeah. Um, we are, we are, we have the offensive strength right now. We are on offense right now. Um, whereas every other cycle that I ever worked in politics or journalism in my life, Democrats were on the defense. Um, I brought this up to someone the other day and they said, no, we were on the offense in 12. And I said, I worked on president Obama's reelection campaign in 2012. And we were constantly having to realign the conversation they were starting about abortion. They were right. starting about immigration. It we maybe like we won out there, right? Like because most people aligned with our values and our positions, but we we were not setting the agenda for the conversation by any means, and we hadn't in a really long time. And I think that that shifted in the pandemic with how quickly and horrifically, the president botched the response to that pandemic and it provided the media was not with him. Right. And so that helped too. Um, and I think that we are, we are really on the offensive right now um, because they have gone too far with the Supreme court and what they've done and the insurrection and um, the hypocrisy around crime versus their positions on gun control, all of these things, it actually has given us a moment of strength there. And so I think that is so important. I saw that there is a question in the chat too, about what are the best ways to count Interact the Magda lies. This is it. Like what we do at Courier Newsroom is we do not take the bait. Right. We talk about this all the time at a high level with all of our editors and our reporters, which is that, you know, I'll, I'll give the most, you know, recent example folks will relate to because there's so many that you can provide. But when everyone in this country was rightfully talking about abortion and Kansas because of the unbelievable historic turnout, especially of young women and the historic registration rates in Kansas after the Dobbs decision. And the media is talking about it and personal stories are coming out and there's these horrific stories coming out of the states where the bans have already come into place. The bans are coming into place in other states. This is the conversation because this is where the country is. They are responding to something and their rights being taken away. What does Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida do? He, he pulls a stunt with human lives and he ships them from Texas, not even Florida, to Martha's Vineyard. Why does he do that? He does that to change the conversation to make it about open borders, shamelessly, unapologetically, right? And I really hope that there is like real uh, legal reaction to this in response, because I think that there will be, because I think that they did things illegally with taxpayer dollars in Florida. Um, that will be, that will come out if it happened. but. That is what they were doing. So then Fox News has something, right-wing media all across the internet, they're all talking about immigration and open borders. I don't think that it was successful. I think it was in their spaces. You have to remember that if you don't look at right-wing media every day like I do and you shouldn't, please don't. It's a terrible place to be. But they're not talking about any of the things we're talking about right now. They are trying to spin or they are trying to not take the bait that they see as what's happening on our side. And so it's really, really important that you keep your eye on the ball and you don't respond, even if you want to, even if you want to debunk or you want to talk about how crazy it is. The second that you engage in the conversation you want them to engage in, you have lost the narrative. You have lost the thread. You have to keep focused. And in that situation, you stay focused on abortion, right? I said, like I said, I said to our editors in, in a meeting a number of weeks ago, I said, anytime that you are trying to debunk things that are inaccurate about their attacks on crime or safety of different candidates, it means you're not talking about what the voters are most concerned about, which they have told you and what they tell us in our surveys are abortion in the economy. And so like they want us to move in that direction to talk about crime and safety. You don't do it. You don't do it unless you're hearing from the audience that that's the thing that they want to talk about. So that's that's kind of how we approach it. But I think for other people, don't amplify the lies. Don't take the bait um, when you can help it and make sure that you stay focused on what are what are the narratives? What are the facts? What are the stories that are actually going to move the ball forward on the left? You know, I've done, I did thousands of appearances on Fox News. Um, you know, I was on three to four times a week during the entire Obama administration. I was never paid, by the way. I always did it for free because I didn't want to take money from Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. And one of the things that I learned from all those years, almost 17 years of doing Fox, is that I always knew 
up until uh, up until very recently, um, you know, they would come to me and I would just then say what I was, I had a thing I was going to say, and I was going to say it no matter what the question was, right? And I would just, I put down my positive track and then said, now on this thing that you've asked, let me address it, right? And so I didn't allow them to dictate the terms of the engagement, right? I set the terms of the engagement. And what's interesting is that they had me back all the time. I mean, this was not, you know, what changed is after Roger Ailes got in trouble and then left and then died, you know, the network went completely crazy. And that any kind of, you know, there any kind of reasonable bounds, right, on behavior and lying. And I think the thing that I just want to reflect that I think you've said something that I think is something we actually have to talk about more in, in our family, which is the just the rampant lying. I mean, there's just no, I mean, if you watch Ron and Romney McDaniel's Twitter feed, you know, the chairwoman of the Republican mm -hmm. Party, I would say 80% of what she posts is not true. I mean, it's like 80, 90%. It's not even like 50%. I mean, it, the scale of the lying is just so unbelievable. And it's lying about stuff that is easily knowable because they've created this, you know, as Greg Sargent called it, Foxlandia. I mean, this sort of alternative reality where, and, and one of the reasons I stopped going on Fox is that I had several appearances in a row in 2018 where they would bring things up that I had no idea what they were talking about. Like I literally, I read the news every day, I'm in the game, right? But I, I didn't understand the emerging kind of mythology and these sort of false events that never really took place. You know, they would ask me things about something that, you know, some Democrat had done. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about, right? And so it just became incredibly difficult to even have a fundamental conversation. They were in a right? different reality they were creating. Yeah, and that they were creating. And it was just getting harder and harder for me after, even though I'd been doing it for all these years, right? To spend time at my friend's house, having a conversation with them. My friends had gone kind of crazy, you know? And it was really, but I had one other, I, I had one other thing. You know, you've raised so many interesting issues. But I think part of what I'm reinforcing with you is that I think that you're, it's the way that I operate in my information my, you know, these things I put out every day, these analysis, I, I'm just putting out what I believe. And I'm not, I'm not responding to their stuff. And what's interesting was earlier this year, when I did sort of a thought, an experiment, right, in our collective engagement with this new ecosystem, this information ecosystem, I, you know, argued that this, we were in a competitive election, not a wave election. And in the early days of that effort, I was, I had reporters laughing at me on the phone, I was getting attacked unbelievably on the internet from people for being a propagandist and a polemicist and all this stuff. And, you know, we were able to, the small group of people, we were able to change the understanding of the, of the election. The good news is the data also, it's also happened, right? So it's not just about spin, but I think that the last, I know what I was going to say is that I, I, I have this theory that I want you to chew on and, and that we'll get back to each other in a few weeks about is that I think something has really happened to us as Democrats in the social media space about the way that we internalize attacks against us. And what I mean by that is that when we speak, and I see it on my Twitter feed all the time, and, and the, the way I'm gonna talk about this is that we have to learn how to speak in declarative sentences and not use the word but, right? I think but has become like our biggest enemy in, in, uh, in rhetoric, which is that we say, we're really good, but we didn't do a good job on this. And it's like, why say the but part? Because they're going to say it. So now what we're doing is we're actually internalizing and making their arguments for them uh, all the time, right? We do it. I think, for example, we've talked too much about inflation this year. I think we shouldn't have been talking about inflation nearly as much. And I know there's been this huge debate in the family about this, right? But I think every time we talked about inflation, we were allowing them to set the table and reinforcing their central attack against us. And, and so I, I think this is a really, like, to use, you know, you swore, I'm going to say, we have to sort of unfuck this. We have, to un, we have to unlearn this sort of where we internalize and anticipate because we're nice people and we want to get along with people. And it's rhetorically and politically disastrous because we're spending an enormous amount of our public communications time repeating their attacks against us instead of just making speaking in declarative sentences, saying that the election is going well, not but these things are wrong, right? And so, I mean, just reflect upon that because this is exactly the space that you're living in and trying to help 
us unlearn sort of these bad habits, right, and that we've developed. And I think some of this, by the way, just comes from the ongoing relentless negative attacks by inauthentic actors on social media and where people have been so conditioned and been beaten up so badly that they are now anticipating the attack, right? And don't want to get attacked. And so they're acknowledging it, thinking that's going to fend it off when in fact, this is the exact opposite, I think in many ways. Go ahead. Oh. No, I, I I think that's right. And I'm, I'm sort of smiling because it just, it I, I, I catch myself. We all do it, right? And I also, it, it makes me think about um, some tools that I was given in college and after college that were um, were honestly in, in sort of feminist professional women mentor mentee groups about how to like, you know, use less exclamation points and, and work on your up speak as a woman, because you're not going to do as well if you don't figure out how to adjust for these things in an environment. And I, I do, I think Democrats have a communication problem um, because they are apologetic. They are they are kind, they're defensive, not like they're, they're basically trying to um, make excuses for everything. And you're not going to gain trust that way. You need right. to have confidence. And it doesn't mean you need to be ruthless and lie like the other side. You just need to, to your point, not say their message against you and your own message, <laughs> like lead with, and we, I mean, there's, there is an element of this in our work where it's like, when we think about our audience, there's this distilling of the information where it's like the headline has to be the message. Don't like bury the message at the end of the headline when people are skimming this and are going to read the first thing where it's like, you know, you're putting 10 words like word salad in before you get to the point that so and so like is opposed to abortion, <laughs> right? There's like all these caveats and it's just like just say the facts, say it with confidence. And I think that's really important. And the other thing for folks that are listening about like how to combat this stuff, it's like, don't amplify the arguments of the other side, even when you're, you're debunking them or making excuses for them, but also know your power just as a trusted messenger, because you have friends and you have people that follow you on whatever social platforms you're on in your communities, et cetera. And they might not engage with it. They might not send an emoji to you or comment or write you a message, but they're seeing the content you put out there. And to your point about getting loud, people need to understand that posting things every single day gets us louder, faster. And the other side also does this. They evangelize their base around their, their chum, their red meat, et cetera. Like we need to be out there proudly talking about the accomplishments and talking about it in a way that people talk, not in the way that reporters write headlines. Right. And I think that's, that's the power of social media that we have. And we just haven't tapped into it to the same degree that the other side really has. And they do it in such a messy way that people start to think like, oh, I'm not like that. Or like, oh, I don't need to share that. Like, that's like, I don't know if everyone will agree with that. It's like, who cares? Like, just put it out there if it's factual and if it gets the message across. And I think that the more people that do that, um, the more quickly our messages are going to take dominance over theirs. You know, I was an English major in college and I, I've had three kids and I've worked with them on their, you know, their papers, which has been, you know, probably the worst experience of my life. But the, um, I always tell my, my daughter who's still home that, you know, 50% of your grade is is the actual title of your paper, right? You know, if you're if the title of your paper is actually reflective of what you've written, and if it actually there's a through line that goes from the title to the first paragraph to the last paragraph, that's 50% of your grade, right? Or 60% of your grade. Does, you know, is there a sense that you are in charge of the facts, that you have an argument, that you've assembled these things in a way that somebody can understand, right? And and the what you're saying is just so important um, about the the issue of understanding the scroll, you know, the scroll. The scroll is the whole game now, and it's it's and the scroll is six words. It's an image, you know. It's a graph, a, a, a chart, right? It's it's why I do my posting has so many charts and graphs because I I really do find that charts and graphs are really an important critical part of the social media game yes. right because they tell they tell it's a lot of information right they're yes. conveying a lot of information in a visually simple you got to make them simple right that's the other thing is they've got to be they only can do one or two things on a single graph it gets right like, to the point yeah you need to get to the point what is the point right of, right what's the, yeah. what's the point okay so listen this has been fun let me just turn it to you what what else didn't we talk about that you want to just that's sitting there um you know how do you no. Um, are you optimistic about 
you're look, you're involved, you've been involved in the family, right? You're part of the, the family and you know, you're active with many other family members. And we've had things like crooked media. Assess your if you were listening today, what are you most excited about? about that's going on in, the, in addition to your amazing work, right? Just lay out sort of the architecture or the infrastructure or the ecosystem that you think is emerging that may be new and different. Because one of the things that when I got into this business, one of the things the Republicans did is that they redefined the understanding of what politics was to include talk radio, right? Mm -hmm. That was the first expansion, right? Where talk radio show hosts became part of their politics. They weren't media, they were part of it. And then they, added, they kept adding that and redefining. And I think about you, I think about crooked media, I think about, you know, just lay out what you think is like people should really be paying attention to. Yeah, sure. And I mean, I do, I think, look, I think we're, I think we're late to the game on owning our own media, but it is starting yeah. to turn the corner again, which is great. Um, the, the guys at Cricket are all friends. I think that they do great work. I think um, there are a lot of really interesting. So something that I've reflected on a lot about the media ecosystem today is that it's not about building the biggest megaphone that you can because of everything we talked about, about decentralization. It really is about building media that can build community. And, and I think Crooked has done that. I think Podsafe has done that. They have built a community and they very smartly tell them what they can do, right? This is, this is the transformation of like really effective media is we want people to engage. And we don't, I think another thing is that um, I think a lot about this because of this work and this can be very fraught. I do not, I, I left political advertising and electoral politics directly because I wanted to stop contributing to the problem of increased polarization. This is really, really, really dangerous what's happening in this country where you are either in one camp or the other and all of the folks that don't align themselves with either camp retreat. The only way, we think about this a lot at Career because the only way to reach those communities is to be able to foster trust with them, is to be able to show them themselves, be a part of their lives in a way that is authentic to, to them. And so some of the things I'm most excited about are media that are being built within small communities. Or, and I don't mean community even geographically, I mean people who share interests. I mean, I, I think, I mean, on the sort of political plus media side, I think what Red Wine and Blue is doing is amazing. My friend Katie, Paris started it in Ohio, and it's suburban women that are coming together in red states and communities to organize against things like book bans that they don't want in their schools, or against, um, you know, attacks on LGBTQ kids in their communities where they're really like empowered and they do it through media, they do it through social content that's relevant and community organizing online. And I think that's I would love to see a million different communities that are driven by media and conversation that are, are that people feel a part of and feel a part of beyond just elections. On the left, we too often only build that community around candidates, charismatic candidates like Obama or JFK or what have you, or, or Bernie Sanders. Or and and the problem is when they lose an election or they've been termed out. That community dissipates. We need those communities to be sustained and sustaining. And so those are the things that I'm I'm really excited about is where those efforts are happening. There are um there are different news properties that are popping up. There's a community on work money, which is all about financial insecurity. But they they weave in conversation about what you can do, what your politicians are doing about things that are going to either help your economic situation or not. So I think those things are really exciting. And I think that also when we think about our own communication outside of all the other kind of tips and tools we've given about be declarative, don't amplify the other side's message, don't, don't be apologetic in it, is also I think we have to get away from the us versus them. We can talk about the extremism, we can talk about the facts, we can talk about the dangerous elements of it, we can talk about all those things. But there is what I get very concerned about when I look at a lot of social media too, is that there is like, the, there is like a left that just calls that out and hates that and a right that does that. And we've got to figure out a way to bring back good discourse. And that's not going to happen with the MAGA Republicans. We know that I don't even want to get into the party politics, but it can happen with Americans. And if that's all they're seeing is that there are these kind of two choices. And I think Joe Biden does actually a very good job. People hate him sometimes on the left for it, but of not leaning into that of the, the camp versus camp, where it's like, we've got to figure these things out together. And that's how I think people feel in their own communities, 
but the internet kind of destroys that identity, that, that like connection, it feels like you're just part of the bigger masses. And I want more investment in that, that doesn't come out of the parties or the really partisan camps, but actually is about like, let's, you know, let's talk about gun control because I want my kid to be safe when they go to school. I don't want to worry if they're going to come home or not. Let's talk about the issues in that way. Let's build community around those and build media that helps facilitate that. You know, one thing that's been it's just uh, you got me thinking about is that, um, you know, since I've sort of my analysis has gotten picked up a lot this year, I'm getting invited to speak at a lot of groups and I've offered to speak to any group with more than 100 people um, for free and just to help give them food for thought. And here's something I've learned in the last few months is that during COVID, there were there was an explosion of these small groups of people all around the country who have banded together to write postcards um, to that were at one point maybe 10 people you know in a small town or in their community and then they invited 10 of their friends and they invited and now they have hundreds of thousands of people I mean the postcard write like uh, writing, community has become massive in the Democratic Party. It's just sort of a fascinating thing I've learned, right? And these communities have grown because they're they're now virtual, so you don't have to be geographically located. I spoke at a swing left, um, you know, and Indivisible, I've been speaking to some of their gatherings and, you know, they have state-based chapters, but they also have all these other organizations that are part of their constellation of sort of decentralized, organic Groups, And I think one of the things the Democratic Party really has to think about a lot is how to connect to that world without taking it over, right, okay. to become, because I think this is a form of what you're, disca- you're describing, is. Yes. is that it, these are these, you know, very de Tocqueville, right, it means de, de Tocquevillean, right, is that these are organic communities that have grown up, and, and I think this is a become an enormous part of our collective center left infrastructure in a way that there's been no coverage of this. I mean, this is even something you guys could start writing about and talking about. And and I keep wondering about like, how do I connect these folks to the DNC? And then I think, well, I don't know that that's actually a good idea, you know, because in some ways what makes them powerful is that they're locally owned and they're organic and they grew up through friendships and everything else. And I, I think that this is a much bigger part of our political system than we really all understand right now. And I will tell you, when I speak to these groups, it's like the most gratifying thing that I do in my in my professional life, because it is, I'm so amazed to see these just regular everyday people, citizens giving a shit about their country, you know, spending, you know, I spoke to a group a couple of weeks ago that was one of these postcard writing groups. They had a 24 hour postcard marathon where they had <laughs> speak, they had speakers from a, like Monday at eight to Tuesday at eight, where they were on live for 24 hours. And I, I ended up being- a telethon. 20, yeah, yeah, it was a telethon. I was in the 23rd hour and the people who were running it were all exhausted. They'd all been up for 24 hours. None of them were particularly young, by the way, which was even more impressive. And, mm-hmm. and I just wanna say that I think there's more of this going on, what you're describing, than we collectively understand. And I think we have to figure out how to, air this out and encourage it, right? Like we want we want more people to see that others are doing this. So they then go do their own version of this, right? And it's just, I think that COVID really changed the nature of political um, organiza- you know, organizing or community. Community is the word you've been using, community mm-hmm. in a way that we haven't really, I think, come to really fully understand yet. Anyway, I throw this out. No, not at all. I mean, I have, there's so many threads I can pull on that. I mean, at the end of the day, most of us, if not all of us, we're still human and humans need connection. And so the two, there's two sides of the coin you mentioned about the letter writing community. There's the community that's built where you're writing the letters together and you're doing something together about something you believe in because you care about your country and the future of your country. And then there's the recipients of those postcards who are receiving a handwritten note from somebody who took the time to write that note, which you're going to, you're going to spend more time looking at than any of the other trash in your mailbox because most of the trash and it has an effect. This has been measured. It is a really effective way of engaging people and getting them to turn out to vote. So we need to get back to personal connection and social trust, trusting one another. That's exactly what I was talking about before and, and, and touching on this. And I think that's right. We have to lift up these stories because 
organic is always more effective. It shouldn't be owned by any party. It shouldn't be owned by any organization, but it, it does need to be continually fostered, nurtured, sustained, and, and communities can self-sustain that. And I, I mean, that's the stuff that gives me hope. Like I got goosebumps when you're talking about it because I I see that in my own community. I live in Rhode Island. I don't live in, uh, I wish I lived in a battleground just to be more helpful, but like it's, it, that's where you transcend this stuff. And we can easily forget that when we spend so much time on the internet. Um, but, but it really does matter. And you can take that into your persona online take a more personal approach, remember that stuff and, and, and let it be about, you know, what the difference is to you and in your community. We do that a lot in our reporting. The newsrooms are, you know, center the person. We all want to hear about ourselves. We all want to understand ourselves better, understand our place in the world and in our community and in our family and all of these things. And I think that gets lost in politics generally. It becomes about the lead, the headline, the horse race, all this stuff that drives clicks. Um, it's actually, it's, it, it loses sight of the impact and the reason any of us do this work. So I have one last question. Reflect upon your relationship to positive and negative sentiment. How do you think about that at Courier Newsroom, right? In terms of... Is it better to have positive sentiment? Is it better to have negative sentiment, a mix? Do you actually have a, a, a theory that you want 60%? Yeah. You know, go ahead, explain. We do have a theory. Um, uh, and it's born out a lot of stuff. I mentioned that I, I really want to stop being part of the problem with political advertising. Time and time again, for years and years and years, the most effective political advertising at persuading people who are on the fence for a candidate is often negative. It's more often than not negative. What does that do in the aggregate over time? It absolutely deteriorates trust in politics and government and institutions. And we are seeing that bear out, right? We are seeing that now today. Reporters from my former days of journalists and all my journalism friends and everything, reporters are not incentivized to talk about the good that government does when it does good. So the media is not doing it. Campaigns aren't doing it in their advertising. Who's doing it? Why would you trust politicians or government if you're not somebody who is already a party person or a lifetime Democratic or Republican voter or, you know, a MAGA evangelist? And so, like, we do, we have a real theory on the case of this, that we we have a responsibility to lift up the factual good that government, the administration, state houses, governors do when they do good, regardless of party, right? If a Republican does something good that aligns with our values related to action on climate change or reproductive freedom, absolutely that should be that should be reported on, that should be celebrated, that should be lifted up. But we do have to talk about that. And then the other thing is things that just relate to people that have nothing to do with politics because that's how you build trust. So up until like right now, which is like obviously 32, 33 days out from the election, um, year round, what our newsrooms do is it's about 60 to 70% coverage that is positive that has nothing to do with politics or elections. And it's a very small per percentage where we weave in the vegetables, as we call it, and make sure that we are informing about these things, but that we have that balance of positive. Um, of course, we are going to hold elected officials and candidates accountable for their lies, for their role in the insurrection, uh, for their um, stance on no abortion without any exception. Like, I mean, these are the things that um, matter to our audiences, matter to Americans, and that they need to know and deserve to know and have that information. But it's also important that they understand the good because over time that will help restore trust in a government that frankly, I think more people now know is necessary after going through this pandemic than maybe they ever thought of before. Right, maybe the big ar the argument against big government was more effective before, but people understand now the role that government plays in addressing things like hurricanes and hurricane recovery relief, in addressing the pandemic, we actually do need this. A government is about supporting the population and making sure that it's healthy and prosperous and uh, it can go in a lot of different directions. But I think that there is a shift happening there and, and we have to get a better grasp on that. The way I talk about it is we need smart government, not big or small government. We just right. need government, government that works, you know, and does a good job. And that's what people should expect, you know, and uh, it's a reasonable thing for people to expect that. And that works for the most, not the least of us. So. Right. Tara, I, I, I'm going to say one last thing. We'll wrap up is that I want to I almost feel like I want to go on a road show with you about this whole issue of positive and negative sentiment, because I. I think this is actually, in addition to these sort of other hinge points we've discussed today about sort of broadcast versus, you know, social, you know, the changing this, I, part of the reason, you know, in 2018, I was part of the DCCC team, and we had a theory of the case about this, about positive and negative sentiment, and that I helped drive, and 
um, you know, we outperformed all the other committees. You know, we got eight and a half percent of the vote. We picked up more seats than anybody thought we would. And I will tell you that part of the DCCC's strategy was bio ads, you know, simple name ID, positive stories about impressive people, second, all the issue stuff, totally secondary, right? And and I and we just and I as I told Dan Senna and Ben Ray Lujan is like the Republicans are going to make the negative case. We got to make our positive case. Yeah. And one of the things we learned was that in 2016, we you know we spent too much money on negative ads as a percentage of our uh, turn and burn, you know, and we, no one was making the positive case. So there was no reason to vote for us. And what I've told all the party committees and what I've told Ron and everybody else is that the close here, we got to close positive here. We need to give more people a reason to vote for us. They know these guys are crazy, right? They understand that. That's baked into the cake. We will get the turnout we want, and we will have the election we want if people have a reason to vote for us. I still think we can do better on that. I mean, we only need a couple more points, Tara. Like, we need one or two yeah. more points, and we're going to have a really, really good election. Um, and I think if we, I'm just worried that this family, right, is so negative and full of angst that we're going to hit the old negative buttons again, like we always do, right? The media consultants are going to make that call because we're not exactly where we want to be. And I think if we close with too high a percentage of rotation of negative, we're not going to have the election we want. And and I and so, you know, it's, I, we, anyway. And we've maybe never had as much to talk about. No, that's the whole point, that. right? I and mean, that's look, potentially done. And you did this yesterday, right. the first ever federal part yeah. burden of any federal yeah like uh, marijuana convictions that is massive that is also a yeah. massive evolution by joe biden that should yeah. be celebrated right. on an issue that is immensely popular and and, and and that's you know that's one thing of a, a hundred and i i mean i am i'm i am so surprised at how much this administration has gotten done i'm blown away by it yeah me and, too and we we have to talk about it and we have to we have to really make sure that people know that and know that this is just the start of what's possible if we're able to be able to expand never mind protect the majority well I think. And, and, I, and i think that um we'll wrap up i could talk to you forever and you've been amazing sorry we didn't take more questions but we were looking no. at them and kind of incorporated them into the into the discussion and listen good luck thank you for your courageous spirit and you're you know as somebody who's been kind of an on you know an entrepreneur i'm aware of how and somebody's run my own organization for 26 years i mean it's hard running anything and you know it's you get up every day and it's you i mean yes you have a team but it's still you you know and you know i'm just really proud of you i think you've done it's amazing you're so articulate and smart and and uh and we need to figure we need to figure out Tara to have this conversation with thousands and thousands of leading people in the center left to help them understand how to better navigate the information environment that they're in today. This isn't this stuff isn't aired out as much as it needs to be, and a lot of the old think about top down you know advertising is still too dominant in our family. And so thank you, thank you for your leadership, your courage, your willingness to innovate, to break, you know, break out of uh, old think, right, and do new think, and and good luck, and how do we follow you? How do people uh, hear? Thank yeah. you, that's all very kind, Simon, and yeah. you can have me back anytime, I will have these conversations yeah. anytime, I love it. Um, yeah, Tara E. M. C. G. Tara E. McG at, at Twitter is my Twitter handle, you can follow me there, DM me there, I'm very accessible, and then couriernewsroom.com, um, and we also have a cool program, Courier. It, it's called Good Info Messengers, where you can sign up and you can actually get kind of tips and content to share in your communities or with friends who live in the states that we're in. So go to couriernewsroom.com, at Courier Newsroom at Twitter. Thank you, Simon, for bringing this group together. Thank you, everyone, yeah. for spending time with us on a Friday afternoon. Um, got just a few weeks left. So again, cautious optimism. But Yeah. Listen, thanks, better. everybody. Go fight, win, and, and make sure that Remember, vote early. Don't just vote. Yes. Vote early is so important because it creates more. And when the numbers are not good, we have to get those numbers up. Yeah. And vote voting early, early, it allows us to increase our turnout and it also makes the elections run smoother, which is going to be really important this year. So make sure you just don't vote and volunteer and give, but you vote early. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everyone.